Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. Ron will not be joining us today. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're spoke we're speaking with no, I don't we're think speaking so. with Katie mm-hmm. Granger about septic shock. Katie, uh, about four years ago, at the age of fifty-two, her life was turned upside down when she nearly died from septic shock because of a small infected cut on her thumb, and she's going to tell us more about it today. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Katie. Hi, Katie. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. I've been enjoying your podcast. Oh, thank thank you. you. How is the weather there in Hawaii? Okay, so I'm in Seattle right now. I spend part of my time in Seattle and part of my time in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can guess which months I go which place. But I'm in Hawaii pretty much from Christmas through May. And then when it starts getting really hot there, I come back to Seattle. Okay. And I get to enjoy the beautiful summer months. So it's actually lovely here today. And the summers here are among the most beautiful in the world, I think. Great. Partially because we spend, um, if you spend the winter here, you are doing it underneath cloud cover very often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's just nice to have the sunshine and it's been it's been a lovely summer. Those Great. are Lita's two favorite places. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I love Hawaii and Hawaii. we're going to uh, the San Juan Islands next week. Yep, yep. So, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Lita, yeah. where are you? I don't even know where you guys are. Chicago. Yeah, where just outside of Chicago. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, I'm glad you make it out here. The San Juans are gorgeous. Oh, yeah. love it. And love it. I absolutely love Hawaii. Yes. Yes. And um, hi, Katie. It's Jean Marie. Um, and I just want to say that, um, yeah, if if we have our, our druthers, we'll be doing, Living we'll be there. following your example <laughs> because uh, it couldn't get better. <laughs> right. Um, could you walk us through what happened four years ago? Absolutely. So I'm coming up on my four year anniversary in September, <clears throat> but I will walk you through it. Okay. So I had um, been visiting my daughters in college. I was living in Hawaii at the time. My husband and I and my children had moved there, had been living there for 10 years. And um, at this point in time, it was 2018, September, and both of my daughters were away in California. My oldest daughter had just graduated college the prior May and was starting her first job. And then my younger daughter was a, just starting her junior year. So I had come down to visit them um, in California, had done this little loop through Seattle, seeing my friends here and had got on a plane, headed home back to the island of Kauai, which is one of the smaller Mm -hmm. of the outlying outlying Hawaiian islands. And um, when I landed, I noticed a kind of pinkish purple bump on my thumb. It was not very big. I would say like the size of a mosquito bite, but it was oozing a little bit of fluid Um, just a clear fluid. It just seemed unusual. Mm -hmm. And we had had a large flood there a few months prior. So we were on the lookout for infections. Everyone was being real careful, knowing that in the floodwaters, we could get an infection. And actually the word sepsis had been thrown around a little bit because we all recognized that there was something that could happen beyond an infection where you would get really sick. No one really knew the details. I don't think, I mean, there might've been a few people, but I did not know all the details, Mm -hmm. but I just knew that I could get really sick from an infection. So I thought on my way home, I live an hour from the um, hospital. So I thought on my way home, I'm going to go by an emergency clinic and get it checked out. Mm -hmm. I did that. I went in, my vital signs were strong. This is important to notice because I was not exhibiting any of the symptoms of sepsis at this point. I had a strong heart rate, strong blood pressure, strong breathing rate, and my temperature was normal. So um, they looked at the they looked at the thing on my thumb and said, yeah, it does look a little unusual. They gave me a prescription antibiotic, which would have treated it if it was MRSA, it would have been able to kill the MRSA. And then they gave me an oral antibiotic since it was a weekend and said, if it seems a little worse tomorrow, go ahead and start taking the antibiotic and let us know if it's not getting better. Mm-hmm. So they kind of gave me that that traditional warning that you get when you visit a doctor's office. And I just know from my past experience that I'm sure I took that document, threw it on the seat of my car, and then just never looked at it again. Mm. So I headed to the um, to the pharmacy. I picked up the prescription that I needed. And while I was there, I grabbed a thermometer because in my mind, I thought if I'm going to get sick from an infection, surely I'm going to have a fever. Well, it turns out that this is not actually accurate. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. 
So I got home over the weekend and I was taking my temperature. I will note now that I don't really have memories of the weekend. Um, I think it's because of the things that happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. I was put in eventually into an induced coma. And so I think that that right there kind of just messed up my memories for the weekend. I was aware of what was happening at the time, I think, based on what my friends have told me. But, um, but I just, for whatever reasons, I don't remember it. So I do know myself well enough to know that over the weekend, I was taking my temperature and it was coming back what I was registering to myself as normal. What I know from my past experience is that if I take my temperature and if it's under like 97 degrees or you know 98 degrees, I just assume I didn't leave it in long enough, but I leave it in long enough that I figure if I had a fever, it would register. Okay. So I was not really being as accurate as I could have. And I never had understood that you could have an illness with a low temperature. Mm -hmm. So I now know that to be true, that if temperature under 96.8 degrees can indicate that you actually have a low fever or low temperature, and that can be a cause for a trip to the hospital just to check and make sure everything's okay. So I missed that, I missed that symptom. Um, I was sleepy from my travel. And so I told a couple of people via text that oh, I just got home, I've been traveling, I'm just kind of tired, I'm just gonna lay in bed, I'm not, you know, not feeling 100%. I didn't, I just said I have this cut on my finger, you know, I'm sure I'm fine. And I just sort of rested the day away. And um, I suspect that I slept most of the weekend. Um, I took an antibiotic on the second mornings on Saturday. And I know this because I sent my husband a note. I had told him about the bump on my finger and I sent him a photo. And he was in Montana on a, or excuse me, Idaho on a fishing trip. Okay. So he was out of the state. My children were in California and I was home alone. Oh. So I had texted him and I was sort of keeping in touch with them, just saying, hey, I have this little bump. It's weird. I'm, I'm having it looked at. I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. But um, I told him, I said, I threw up today, but it, I'm sure it was just because I took an antibiotic on an empty stomach. Mm. So that tells me two things. It tells me that I took the antibiotic, which means that the thing was getting worse on my finger. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking it upon myself to start the medical treatment that was sort of the next step, mm -hmm. but I wasn't paying enough attention to realize if it was getting bad enough to go to the emergency room okay. or I didn't recognize these other symptoms. I didn't, I didn't heed the, the signal that my body was throwing up. Maybe it was because of the infection. You know, I sort of wrote it off. And I think that that's something I know women especially tend mm -hmm. to do that. Right. But I think anybody, we sometimes minimize our symptoms. So yeah. one of my messages is please don't minimize your symptoms. Okay. Be honest, be honest with the people around you and really keep track of what's happening. Okay. Um, so then um, I went to bed that night. So right there, I've, I've had um, this fever is kind of indicating that there might be a problem. I knew I had the infection. And I'm extremely sleepy, which can be a sign of one of the signs of sepsis, sepsis which is mental decline. And then um, at this point, I wasn't feeling really sick. I don't think, I think I was just tired. So I went to bed on Saturday night, but then I woke up on Sunday morning and I texted my friend and said, and this is at the crack of dawn. So it's very early for me. This would be unusual behavior. At the crack of dawn, I texted my friend and said, can you please take me to the hospital? And she said, well, can we just go to the emergency room? I said, no, we can't. I have never been so sick. Those were the words I used. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you with sepsis, we use an acronym TIME, T-I-M-E. And I mentioned temperature, which can be high or low. Okay. I is for infection. Sepsis always happens with an infection. M is for mental decline, which can include sleepiness. That's a pretty subtle sign though. Oftentimes it might include other symptoms like um, kind of um, being disoriented, seeming kind of drunk, or even seeming like I have dementia, that would be a real sign of mental decline. Mm -hmm. And what that's showing us is that your body is low in oxygen. And then the final symptom that often happens with people with sepsis is they say something like, I've never been so sick, or I feel like I'm going to die. They're extremely ill. And if anyone ever says that, I always tell everybody, get them to the hospital, mm -hmm. trust a person's instincts. If they're saying that they're that sick, get them checked out even if they can't tell exactly what's wrong. Right. I mean, it's like, there's just, sometimes we just know. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, she came and got me on Sunday morning. And um, I, I don't remember much about that morning, but I do remember waking up in the morning and saying to my, in my head, it was almost like there was a voice saying, you have to tell them how to get into the house. And I knew that I needed to give somebody a code to get in, but oh. I didn't know who. And it turns out it was my friend that I had just texted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I texted the code to my house where she could find the key in the key box. She let herself in. And when she came upstairs, she found me unresponsive on my bed. Oh. She was able to wake me up when she touched me, 
and got my attention, but I was just basically passed out on my, on my bed. Yeah. And she was extremely worried. I remember hearing her say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Katie, oh my gosh. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I must really be sick. She's acting really unusual. Mm -hmm. So she, she got me up. She realized it was difficult to get me dressed. I was just not, you know, ready to go to the hospital, but she just wrapped a blanket around me. And when we went to stand up, I was complaining that my feet hurt and she had no idea what that was about. I didn't know at the time either, but what we ended up doing is she said, okay, fine. I'm going to sit you on the floor. We're just going to scoot across the floor and I'm going to scoot you down the stairs and I'm going to get you out to my car. So when we got by the car, she said, you know, I really think maybe we should call an ambulance, but I'm worried because it's 20 minutes toward the hospital. It's really the other direction. I know that that's where they're stored. Okay. And so she said, you know, how would you feel if we just put you in the car and we drove toward the hospital? And if we need an ambulance, I'll call one on the way. And we agreed that that was the best solution. I just wanted to get out of there. So mm -hmm. she lifted me up, put me in her back seat and, um, you know, helped me into her back seat. I just laid down the whole way. And about 10 minutes out from the airport, our trip went great. We were able to get through traffic really easily, but about 10 minutes out, we hit traffic and I started crying in the back seat and saying, Tiffany, are we there yet? My hands and feet are on fire. I, you know, how soon are we going to be there? I'm really sore. This really hurts. And I was crying and whimpering. So she called the hospital. She called ahead and just said, look, we're coming in. She has at least the flu, but something more, her hands and feet are on fire and something's really wrong. She can barely sit up. She's barely conscious. And so they met us at the, at the, um, emergency room entrance with a gurney. They loaded me onto it and they took me into the emergency room and they started checking my vital signs. They immediately determined that my blood pressure was 50 over 30, which is extremely low yes. and an indication of shock. Yeah. So at this point, they know that I'm very sick. My hands are on fire and I'm in shock. And I think at this point, I don't know for certain, but I highly suspect they were suspecting sepsis. And um, I will right now define sepsis. Thank um, you. Sepsis, <laughs> yeah, sepsis is not the infection itself, but sepsis is a body's dysregulated response to an infection. So basically your body overreacts. Mm -hmm. Your immune system sort of goes haywire. And instead of it sh shooting, you know, going out and your white blood cells are just attacking the bacteria or whatever's causing the infection, your body starts attacking itself and it starts causing tissue damage. So in addition to this infection that you have that's causing damage and inflammation in your body, your own body has turned on itself and it's it's almost like you've become overwhelmed with a, a um, the, whatever is causing it, a pathogen, whether it's a bacteria or a virus or whatever, you, you become overwhelmed with it and your body just goes haywire and starts attacking itself. So it, it is a response that can sometimes happen to an infection and that's what was happening within me. So they took my other vital signs. At this point now, my breathing rate is very heavy. Um, I'm having difficulty breathing. I am, have an increased heart rate. Both of those are an indication that I have low blood oxygen. Mm -hmm. And um, they're realizing that my vital signs are not strong. I'm not doing well. So they put me, they bring me into the ICU and they begin what we call a sepsis protocol, okay. which is they draw blood from my body so that they can, they can begin trying to determine what pathogen is causing infection. And with sepsis, it can be caused by a bacteria, a virus, a fungus or a parasite. So they need ideally to determine what's causing the infection so that they can get the right anti, you know, either antibiotic mm -hmm. or antimicrobial that will kill whatever's causing me to be sick. Sure. And um, the best way of doing that is to draw this blood. Now, this is a lengthy process. It can take, it can actually take several days if it's a bacteria. And most often, by the way, um, sepsis is usually caused by a bacteria. So their first line of defense then is to begin administering um, broad spectrum IV antibiotics. And then also, and they increase your fluids by a lot. They give you an IV with a lot of fluids. They push a lot of fluids in your body, trying to increase your heart rate, or excuse me, your, your blood, uh, pressure. blood pressure. Right. Right. And if that doesn't work, it's a good indication that you do have sepsis. Mm -hmm. So spent the day going through this. Um, I had oxygen in my nose initially. And by the end of the day, it was in a, it was being kind of pressed into my body with a pressurized mask. Um, when you're in the Hawaiian islands and you're on one of the outer islands, it, everyone pretty much knows if you become really sick, you're going to take an air ambulance over to Honolulu, which right. is the main Hawaiian um, city. Mm -hmm. And there's some really nice big hospitals there. So they're going to get you out of the small regional hospital and they're going to get you into the state level one trauma center or one of the larger hospitals over there. Mm -hmm. And at this point, my family had been contacted 
they were trying to reach my husband who was out of contact because he was in, you know, at a fishing river up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And um, my 24 year old daughter at the time who had just graduated from college was now the adult of the family trying to manage this. She actually had had a friend who had sepsis three years prior and her friend got as sick as I did and she lost a leg to sepsis. Mm. So my family understood what the word, we understood what the word was. We sort of understood what it was, but like I say, we didn't know the symptoms. So I missed the symptoms. And now I found myself in this medical emergency that her friend had experienced. So my daughter was terrified. She was extremely Mm -hmm. aware that I could lose a limb Mm -hmm. or I could lose my life. And she's having to manage the other members of the family that she's contacting. I'm fortunate that I have a sister-in-law who's a doctor. So she took over my medical, um, sort of as my medical um, information specialist. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I, yeah, so I was, I was fortunate. So I I was able to tell the doctor that I wanted her to be able to speak on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And I guess that all day long, I was conversing with everybody but I have no memory of that. So sure. um, it's funny because I've talked about it. I'm like, I wish they'd let me talk to you. My daughter said, they did let you talk to me. I did talk to you. Wow. You just don't remember. Right. So I was under good care and it was determined that the best hospital that we were getting advised by everyone who was now kind of consulting, which was a lot of people, it was friends of friends of friends. You know, everyone was reaching out to see if they knew anybody in the medical community. And it was suggested that I go to the Queens Hospital over in Honolulu because they have hyperbaric chambers, which they use for dive accidents. Right. Mm-hmm. And those have been proven to do well for wound healing and for just general oxygenation of blood in your body. So, um, and, and that was sort of, we had multiple people who were coming to that same conclusion. My friends on Kauai were suggesting it and um, the people that my sister-in-law, the doctor was talking to. And then even um, one of my friends who came to be with me um, she was inquiring around the Seattle area. And okay. also people were saying, try and get her to Queens because they have these hyperbaric chambers right. and it might help with her circulation. So at this point, um, my hands and feet, I mentioned were on fire. Right. This, um, what was happening is that I had blood vessels. I had clotting and um, kind of bursting of blood vessels in my fingertips and in my feet. And it's a condition called DIC, but um, it's, um, I I can't even think what it stands for. Um, DIC, I just forgot the word for it. Sorry about that. But um, so I had DIC, but there's another thing that can happen that's common with people who have sepsis is that in order to treat it and in order to get the blood into your internal organs, Mm -hmm. they have to draw it out of your extremities. Your body will sort of start doing that on its own, Mm -hmm. but there's a medication called a presser that a doctor needs to choose to give you. And when they make the choice to give you a presser, If they give you a small amount, you'll be fine. But if they give you the increased amounts that are really going to push the blood into your core to try and save your vital organs, they know that they risk you losing limbs. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it described as the decision they make is called a choice of life over limbs. And that choice had to be made for me. They had to realize they're like, we're, we're giving you pressors. We're increasing them. They're called vasopressors and they constrict your blood vessels and in order to raise your blood pressure. But if it's not working, which it wasn't in my case, they have to keep increasing the amount. And the more they increase it, the more dangerous it becomes. So with a combination of the DIC and the vasopressors, my extremities were at risk okay. kind of this whole time. And the, the doctor certainly knew that. I think my family was aware of it. I was less aware, I think. I don't think I was, I, I know now from experience that I was in denial for a while about all of this. So Mm -hmm. I'm sure that I was already using that protective mechanism that my brain had Mm -hmm. to say, oh, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You know? So um, on that evening, Saturday evening, I was still in the hospital, the um, hospital that we wanted to get transferred to, Mm -hmm. all of the beds were full at the ICU. So we've all heard about with COVID how we need to be concerned about overrunning our hospitals. This was just an ordinary weekend a year before COVID happened. And there was no room in our level one trauma center for me. There was another bed at another hospital, which is is comforting, but we really wanted to get me to those, um, to the equipment that they had at that hospital. So on that evening, my hands began to turn purple and I can only assume that my feet were also starting to do it. I didn't see my feet. And like I say, I think I was in a little bit of denial. So if they were talking about it, I was trying to ignore it. Mm -hmm. But I think that I was already having circulatory problems there. So in the morning, they'd gotten in touch with my husband. He was now on his way from, he had gotten out of Idaho to Salt Lake City and was going to fly to Honolulu. And then the plan was that I was also going to fly to Honolulu. And ideally, we would meet there, which did work out well. Mm -hmm. So that morning, um, 
they talked to me and I actually saw the paperwork that I signed, giving them authorization to intubate me in order to make me more stable for the flight over to Honolulu. Because one of the things I've learned is that whenever you transfer someone from a hospital, if they're in an ambulance or an air ambulance in my case, or both in my case, uh, that's the biggest risk of losing somebody because we don't have all the medical equipment. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, they realized that they needed to get me stabilized. So they put me on, it's basically life support. Mm -hmm. right. They put a breathing tube down my throat. There was equipment breathing for me. Um, I was put into a drug induced coma and um, they loaded me onto a gurney, put me in an ambulance, then onto an airplane that flew me over to Honolulu and then into another ambulance where I drove to the hospital. And at this point, I had a good friend from Seattle who, who was there with me. She got the news um, on Saturday morning that I was in the hospital, realized how severe it could be and immediately got on a plane to be with me oh, so that she perfect. could support me knowing that my kids were kind of in charge now. And she just said, nope, I'm gonna step up. I'm gonna be in charge. Your kids can manage from the mainland and I'll help you know manage the communication. So she was with me and she flew to Honolulu with me. Nice. So when I got there, my husband was there and he had been waiting for about an hour. I rolled in on a gurney and he said I was unrecognizable. At this point, I had so much fluid in my body that I weighed as much as I did when I was full term pregnant with both of my daughters. Mm. So I had started out weighing 114 pounds and I weighed somewhere around 140 when I got to the hospital. I had that much fluid in my body. So I was just this huge swollen person and I still was having difficulty. So he introduced himself to the doctors as they were whisking me by and they just said, sit down, we'll be out in a few minutes. She's not stable and put and took me into the ICU. So when they came out, um, I sat down with my husband and they explained, you know, that I was in severe septic shock, that um, they were concerned about me. They were asking him questions like, does she have a will? And does she have a healthcare directive? And do you have access to those things? Wow. So those were on the island of Kauai in a safe deposit box or in actually in a file at our house. And he called a friend and had him go to the house and get the file and um, had arranged that my friend, that the friend would fly over if it was needed. And obviously they were hoping it wouldn't be that desperate, sure. but that was the plan that they had put in place. And then the doctor explained to my husband that he should call my children and have them come over. So at this point he was realizing, oh my gosh, this is they're concerned that she yeah, may not. Right, be. right. Yeah. And yeah, they weren't talking about it yet. They, I don't, I don't know that that he actually said the words, but all the all the indications. All, right, mm -hmm. right. From mm -hmm. everything he was saying and seeing. Yeah. Right. Oh. Darn. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Katie, I'm going to backtrack. I, I mean, like, yes. Go ahead. I I have been, I have been like enthralled with your story. Mm -hmm. I am I am so sorry this happened to you, but let's review. What are the symptoms of? sepsis what do well, people you said time i know right. uh, let's go over it again because this is yeah, so, so important and you're being will, an advocate yeah so what's Absolutely. the what's, i appreciate it and yeah one of, so one of the things i've realized in my advocacy is that not only do i want people to recognize um the signs of sepsis and i've done a lot i've i've become really active this year on TikTok, which is a really fun way for me to make these right. short videos to right. sort of explain these things and i figured out that I don't need them to diagnose sepsis at home or know that it's sepsis. I just need them to know that sepsis exists and there are certain symptoms to look for when your body is in an emerg a medical emergency and you need to get to the hospital. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm hoping that by looking for the signs that I indicate today, that people will notice that something's wrong. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to mention sepsis to my doctor and tell them that I want them to rule it out because that's a really great step to take okay. to advocate for yourself. Okay. And, um, but I'm more importantly, I'm just going to recognize that my body's in an emergency. So the main signs of sepsis, which also could indicate another emergency, you might find something sure. else when you get right. there, sure. but whatever the case, your body's having an emergency. So temperature can be high or low, or low. and that's really important that people know. Right. It always takes place with an infection. That's the, um, I mentioned the time acronym. Mm -hmm. So T is for temperature, right. I is for infection. But keep in mind that sometimes we have infections internally. Mm -hmm. We might have a bladder infection that we're not aware of, or um, you know that cold might've turned into bronchitis. And so we might have a bronchial infection, or we may have a polyp on an intestine that we can't see or something internal that we don't even know about. That's not unusual for people to realize that they didn't even know they had an infection. Okay. But certainly if you know you have an infection, you want to look for any indication that you're becoming ill, your body's becoming sick, because that right there is a huge indication to get to the hospital. Okay. So the next um, symptom in M is mental decline. 
if you have the flu, you're generally not going to have mental decline. And that, as I mentioned before, can be just being confused, being disoriented, seeming drunk, or possibly even seeming um, like you have dementia, like mm -hmm. just really confused. Right. And then E is for extremely ill, which okay. is the, um, I feel like I'm going to die or I've never been so sick are things that are often said. Okay. And um, it can be, in, you can at that time have aches and pains. You can be having stomach issues, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes vomiting. Um, any indication of flu-like symptoms, you know, that you might have, you may have mottled skin where you have like little marks on your skin. Sometimes mm -hmm. they can look like a bruise mm -hmm. um, or a rash, but when you push down on it, it doesn't go away. It's mm -hmm. like a little mark that you're, that's showing an indication that your blood vessels are having issues. Okay. And um, you might have cold hands and feet or sore hands and feet like I did. Okay. Cold, okay. clammy skin, any indication of those other symptoms. Okay. And then the other thing I always want to remind people of is to check. It's super easy to check your heart rate and your breathing rate. I think instinctively we know when we're breathing heavy or we're having difficulty breathing. Uh -huh. You know, it's kind of a. Right, right. If it sounds like you've been working out, but you haven't been working out, or if you get up to go to the bathroom and it feels like you just ran half a mile, something's wrong. Right. So that's a concern. It means your 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 body is struggling to get enough oxygen. Okay. okay. So I always encourage heart rate and breathing rate. Both of those indicate low okay. oxygen. Right. And certainly if you have that pulse oximeter at home right. that a lot of people now have because of the COVID pandemic, right. check out your blood oxygen levels and make sure that they're not going getting lower. Okay. 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 Good All advice. Right. So you were you were saying that Thank um you. the hospital had your um had advised your husband that this was serious and that they were you know making sure that you had uh, a, a will and wanting all your important documentation on hand possibly and where did it go from there thank you so um so now my husband has called my kids and said you guys get over here and i think he was doing everything through my older daughter so she could maybe talk to the younger i'm not sure they may have, they may have discussed it directly but so remember, I've got a daughter who's a junior in college, right. so she's trying to be in school and she's got this trauma going on and we're trying to keep it at this point, the family's just trying to keep it as normal for her as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, had, had my husband had first, when he got in touch with them, when he got back from the fishing trip, he contacted them, of course, immediately. Sure. Um, bef even before he got back, he contacted them and let them know, just stay put. We've got mom's good friend is with her. Mm -hmm. She's going to, you know, she's going to take care of things. She'll let us know if we need to go over. So his, his idea was he'd come see me and then he'd let the kids know. So then he made the phone call that was the very difficult phone call saying, guys, it's time to come. Yeah. Um, so my older daughter arranged to fly um, through, through Los Angeles. She was in San Diego, flew through Los Angeles. Her sister got on the same flight and the two of them flew over together. And um, they were able to see me, I think that evening, that was Monday evening when they got into town. So I'm not sure if they saw me immediately or not, but they were there and had the option at least. Okay. And then um, they were able to be with me that week. So I did not pass away, as you can tell. So <laughs> I um, spent five days in the ICU. And during that time, they watched my hands and feet turn purple. Mm. And um, the soles of my feet turned black and my fingertips turned black. So they were very aware that I was at least not going to keep my fingertips. It was really clear that they had died mm -hmm. and also my toes. So they knew that I was going to lose at least some of my limbs, but they didn't know how much. So eventually my husband went in and just said, you know, we've been waiting. We've been by our side. We're so worried. Can you please give me an indication of what we can expect her outcome to be? Right. And they said, well, if she survives, you need to be prepared that she's probably going to lose her hands and feet. And so they had to come to terms with this and knowing this without me knowing it must've right. been awful for them. Oh. The realization that they were gonna, and, and I think there was probably potential there that they might even have to make a decision about amputations mm -hmm. without me being awake. Right. So they were, I'm sure, not only scared for my life still, but very scared about all the things and all the changes in my life and what they were gonna have to be telling me mm -hmm. when and if I woke up. So they, it was very, very traumatic for my family. So on day five, I um, was becoming strong enough and my vital signs were becoming strong enough that they felt like they could wake me up. And what they did is they, um, they withdrew the medications that were keeping me in the medically induced part of the coma to where I could kind of get my wits about me. And I remember them saying in my ear, Katie, you're in the hospital. You have a tube down your throat. Don't try and speak. On the count of three, we're going to ask you to cough and we're going to take the tube out. Mm -hmm. So they did that. It was 
way worse than they made it sound. Okay. It took several seconds to pull the tube out. It felt like I was vomiting. I couldn't breathe. I was really disoriented. And when I woke up, unfortunately, my hands went in front of my face. So I saw oh. that my fingertips were black. Mm. So I'm coming out of this. I'm extremely disoriented. I don't know what's happening. I'm on like super heavy, you know, ketamine type drugs. I mean, it's like, I'm really not in a good mental space. Mm -hmm. And I see these black fingertips and I immediately know that they're dead. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about my feet yet, but I am convinced that I'm losing my fingers. And, and I am so disoriented that in the beginning, it was just really super depressing. I didn't even know if I wanted to be alive. I was mm -hmm. thinking that maybe I was going to lose my hands and feet. Mm -hmm. I was just really confused. I wasn't thinking clearly, but I was extremely upset. And, um, my husband got, was right there, got in my face, kind of got me disor or got me oriented. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of when I had my babies, he was sort of holding onto my face saying, focus on me, focus mm -hmm. on me. I love you. You know, you've been sick. You're doing better. I'm so glad you're here. And he was really trying to encourage me. Yeah. So we spent three weeks in that hospital with me doing daily treatments of nitroglycerin cream on my hands mm -hmm. every eight hours. And then being escorted on a gurney and then having to transfer out of the clothes I was wearing into sterile clothing. And then my gurney was lifted into a hyperbaric chamber where I spent 90 minutes. Um, it's basically the equivalent of, it's almost like you're diving, like you're um, diving underwater. They pressurize the room, the little chamber that you're in, mm -hmm. and you have to clear your nostrils just, or your sinuses mm -hmm. like you do when you're diving. Right. And then it, what it does is it takes you the equivalent of taking you down. I think it's like, I don't know what it is, it's, but taking you down a hundred, 200 feet, something yeah. like that. And it puts pressure on your body to hyper oxygenate your blood. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to breathe a really high concentration of oxygen at this, at, in this pressurized chamber. Mm -hmm. And it not only oxygenates your blood, but it improves the healing process after you come out of it. It puts your body under stress and then it improves your healing. So it's a really an effective treatment that they're finding for wound care okay. and um, for oxygenation. So they're trying it on all sorts of new things. I don't think it's been proven yet for this but um, they're getting really good results and they're just sort of using it, knowing that it's, it's going to, ideally it's going to improve things and it's certainly going to make nothing worse. So right. incredibly, we were able to re-oxygenate my hands. They went from being purple and with just like broke, it was just like a big bruised hand. They looked mm -hmm. like the, all the blood vessels were broken and they were able to re-oxygenate them, get my blood supply back. And I only lost the part of my fingers that was black when I woke up. Okay. However, mm -hmm. After three weeks, my husband and my family let me come to terms with this. Mm -hmm. They never said the word amputation. They never talked about having surgeries or anything until I was ready. And after three weeks, I looked at my husband and just, we were about to go in the hyperbaric chamber and I was going to have to change out of all my clothes again and do this thing that we've had to do every day. And I just looked at my husband and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I know we can't save my feet. Mm -hmm. And he just you know, put his head up against me again and just said, babe, I'm so sorry. He goes, you know, he looked at the guy who was the nurse who was helping me with the chamber and just said, we're done. We're going to go back to the room. Thank you very much. And when we got back to the room, they, it was, became really clear that my family had been discussing this for weeks. Oh. They already had several plan options put in place and they offered that I could stay in Honolulu where mm -hmm. we didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And we were actually staying at a friend's rented apartment. And um, it just didn't make sense for me to stay in Honolulu. We didn't want to go back to Kauai because it was such a small hospital. And I knew that at this point, I'm acknowledging that prosthetics are going to have to happen. Right. And um, I knew that that just wouldn't be available there. So we opted to come back to Seattle. Okay. And when I told him that, he said, I told him, I said, we can't get from the garage to the house. I'm worried because we have a, this sunken um, patio that we have to walk over. And he goes, no, no. He goes, we've already put a ramp and you're, we can take you from a wheelchair from the car straight into the house. And we've arranged for you to get a hospital bed on the main floor and we've, we've already got it all figured out. And so that was super comforting yeah, to me to yeah. know that not only did they have a plan in place, but just that they were being so thoughtful and so care, mm -hmm. you know, caring so much for me. So I came back to Seattle and, um, we ended up having to come by air ambulance. And, um, fortunately, as I was crying, as we left Oahu, looking out the window, I looked over at the nurse and, and she, it's funny because the last thing I remember is crying as we were leaving Oahu. And then I remember waking up in Seattle and I realized now that I think she gave me something to sleep. <laughs> I think she saw me crying and probably thought this is going to be a long flight with yeah. this poor woman having yeah. to sit here and cry. So right. really easy for me to give her a little something in her IV. And so I just slept the entire way and woke up in Seattle Good. Okay. and um, was, was taken by ambulance over to Harborview Medical Center, which is our level one trauma center here. Okay. And 
if you live anywhere in this area, you know about Harborview, they not only serve Washington State, but I think they also serve Idaho, Montana, and maybe even Alaska. I mean, so it's a big regional trauma center. So I knew that this hospital would have done amputations. Mm -hmm. And um, even if it was from car accidents or whatever, I just knew that they they would have more experience with, with um, what I was going to need to have done. Sure. So it felt very good coming home. I was sad to leave, but I was really glad to be in a place where they had great medical care. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, Katie, how common is sepsis? It's far more common than we think. First of all, um, for those who haven't heard of sepsis, I don't mm -hmm. want you to be um, feel like you're just totally out of it. It's mm -hmm. um, not a lot of people have heard of sepsis. I think we were up in the range when we would do surveys that like over 70% had heard the word, but it was still far less than 50%. I think even more in the 20 to 30% range that could actually identify any of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And now that we've had the pandemic, mm -hmm. healthcare in general has kind of backed up a little bit. We're down more to only 65% of people even knowing what the word is. And um, so it's more common than anyone realizes. It's a word that everyone should know. Um, thank you, you just put up some statistics, which yeah. is exactly what, I know. Yeah. what is that gonna mention? And that's 1.7 million people in the United States get it per year mm -hmm. and at least 270,000 that was the number that we used before the pandemic. Now we've moved that up to 350,000 wow. um, die from it every year. Wow. So you have about 1.4 million people every year that are surviving sepsis. Some mm -hmm. of them like myself who are losing limbs and having really serious outcomes. And many of whom, um, like over 50% who are experiencing post sepsis symptoms, mm -hmm. um, things like just uh, confusion, um, memory issues, depression, anxiety, um, pain in their extremities where they had blood circulation issues, mm -hmm. even if they didn't lose limbs. Um, it's called neuropathy, like mm -hmm. nerve pain. Um, lots of different symptoms can voice. I had trouble, damage to my voice box from being intubated. Mm -hmm. um, people have difficulty sleeping. I still have difficulty sleeping. So it impacts a lot of people and you do not need to be sick to have it happen. It is more common in the elderly and in neonatal, you know, new babies that are born early or very young people, but it is, um, or people with chronic illnesses or immunocompromised people, mm -hmm. but it can happen to anyone like myself. I was very healthy when it happened and that's not unusual. Wow. Well, and <laughs> I know we have heard of sepsis. My daughter was a medic in the army, um, but had you okay. ever heard of sepsis before? Well, you had heard about it from your daughter's friend. Yes, I oh, had, and I became more aware of it when when our friend got it. it was one of my daughter's um, young friends that had gotten it, and I was shocked at that time, three years prior, to learn that you could lose a limb to it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that this is that thing I'd heard about on the news when I'd seen people becoming multiple amputees because mm -hmm. they just got sick from something. Right. And I was under the impression that it like came from, you know swimming in dirty water or getting, you know, just some, I just assumed it was something really extreme. I didn't know that it could be something. As right. Something as exotic. Right, right. 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 Yeah. And then, um, the friend that had gotten it, she got it from strep throat. So I knew that, and that is very common. Right. So I understood at that point in time, the importance of getting antibiotics early and then taking all of your antibiotics. That was sort of the message I got out of her event, mm -hmm. but I didn't take the time to learn the signs and symptoms. So that's why I really want people to okay. make sure they know that just like you would want to know the signs of a heart attack or a stroke, mm -hmm. you should know the signs of sepsis. Right. right. And, sure. I, and I, I guess um, we're all very grateful that you had someone nearby and close friends and an amazing family. So, um, you know, that that's all absolutely. one absolutely fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Um, and what was the most challenging aspect? I mean, you were in the hospital for a long time, but what was the most challenging aspect of being in the hospital and being in the ICU? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the the biggest thing, okay, folks, so the first thing I would say is coming to terms with the whole amputations and mm -hmm. like the, I mean, immediately I'm coming to this reality that I'm really sick as I wake up, but then I'm seeing that my fingers are dead. Yeah. So, and that was extremely hard for me to process. And especially in this confused state that I was in, which brings up the second difficult thing, which is called ICU delirium. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely common for someone that's been in the ICU. The longer you're in there, the worse it can be. For me, it lasted eight days. And this is not just mild confusion. This is like dementia-like confusion. Mm -hmm. I was hallucinating. Mm -hmm. I was talking to my husband nonstop about things that hadn't happened. 
and my and I also had my older daughter was there as well. She took some time off work to be with me. And um, I was just constantly talking about things that weren't actually going on. I was um, saying things like I didn't know if I'd paid the medical insurance. And I was um, I thought people had, you know, were were had gotten had hacked my computer and stolen all of our money from the bank. And then I thought they were able to get from my bank account into my husband's business accounts and that they'd stolen all of his money. So I'd close my eyes and I'd hallucinate and then I'd wake up and I'd tell my family all these crazy tales. And that lasted for eight days. My husband really did think I had brain damage. He was really concerned about that. And I feel like it's something, ICU delirium is very common, but I feel like it's something that isn't necessarily explained as well to people as it should be. Um, so that's one of the things I like to do too, is normalize that when you spend time in the ICU, it's not unusual for you know up to a week or even a little bit more to be extremely confused and even have hallucinations during that time. Okay. Sure. And, and then and the none of that was thing, none of that was due to the ketamine or other medications that they were giving you for pain and things? It probably, yeah, it probably was due to that. Okay. I, I don't think they know exactly what the cause of ICU delirium is because okay. you can't separate out all the things. Right, that right. It's right. medicine or is it the body? Right, right. Yeah, you're you're overhearing people day and night. I'm mm -hmm. sure they were talking about insurance, and mm -hmm. then I had some nightmare that I hadn't paid for. Yeah, it. you know, I'm sure I heard some of the things that they were saying, and it was causing me to come up with some of my hallucinations. Okay, okay. okay. And um, we've we've seen um, the delirium as well um, in several cases with our family members. Uh, when my grandfather had on. Um, he was uh, actually dying from a hepatitis and a cardiac condition, and he thought that the gentleman who was in a coma across from him was going to blow up the hospital and was very insistent that that was going to happen. And then my cousin, who was also dying of a liver um, disease, thought that she was president of the United States <laughs> and tried to punch someone when they wouldn't follow her directions. Uh, That's funny. I, I also, I told my sister-in-law at one point, um, because I knew that, um, I knew that one of my sisters-in-law knew someone who worked at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I had in my head twisted it around that I was a special guest of the hotel. I thought I was oh. in a very fancy hotel and that, um, I was a special guest of the president of the hotel because in my head, there was a president of the hotel that I was in. Sure. And at <laughs> one point I said to my sister-in-law, do they know that I'm a special guest? <laughs> and she said, and That's she so said, cute. it was really cute. She just touched my arm and she said, Scott, I'll explain it to them. <laughs> so at this point they were getting used to my delusions and mm -hmm. they, she was just going along with it, which honestly was the best way that they right. could handle it. Sure. When they tried to tell me things weren't real, I was confused, but if they just went with it, then I was like, okay, great. It, you, you, you're taking mm -hmm. care of it. You right. Know? right. So that was helpful for me. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Because that's, yeah, that's, and, and did they um, brief your family at all about that so that they knew what they were seeing or? You know, I, I do a lot of advocacy now, sort of as a patient advocate. And I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, if you think about why you're in an ER and certainly why you're in an ICU, they're there to save your life. Right. And they're focusing on saving your life. Okay. And with that obviously comes communication with the family. But I think that, um, Sometimes in these high um, stress situations mm -hmm. where they're, you know, we're literally life and death situations, I think sometimes some of the steps get skipped or they're just glossed over. So, yes, I think certainly they did say this isn't unusual. We see this sometimes. Right. But I don't think they really stated saying it's really very common and it could last as long as a week and she might seem completely crazy, but don't be alarmed. <laughs> I don't think they really stressed that as much as they could have. Okay. And um, when I speak to patient groups or mm -hmm. Um, hospital groups that are looking at patient experience, I always stress that, that there's probably ways that they could communicate with both the patient and the families a little bit better. And um, and I know that they're, they care about that kind of feedback sure. and they try to take it into account. And I'm sure sometimes it's handled perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I was a very, very high risk. I mean, they did not expect me to live right. and right. they were doing everything they could to try and save me. So um, I would say at the bottom of the list of important things for them to do, this was near the bottom sure. was trying to explain all this to my family. Okay. So um, I don't really fault them in it, but I do think that there are systems that could be put into place that might make it a little bit more clear to people. They could maybe manage it differently or just look at the way to change systems within different hospitals to, sure. sort of, to let them know, let patients and families know a little bit more about what's going on. Okay. Good advice. And um, Katie, are you aware of any innovations or research that's being done to help um, prevent or uh, increase the rapidity of diagnosis or the treatment of sepsis and um, 
you know, anything in that region? I am. So I work with a company. Um, this is just one of the companies, but I'm going to use mm -hmm. them as an example. Okay. Um, I just did a talk for a sales group at a company called T2 Biosystems. Okay. And they're an example of a company that is innovating to try and find, um, speed up the diagnostics sure. for sepsis. And I mentioned before that, you know, if they're taking a Petri dish and trying to put mm -hmm. a sample of my blood onto it and they're waiting to culture it out, it can take many days. Yes. And the quicker that they can target an antibiotic or maybe even determine that it's not a bacteria, maybe it's a virus that's causing it. So the quicker that they can identify whatever that pathogen is, mm -hmm. the quicker they can get you an effective treatment and it can save lives. So they've got a program or they've got a um, system available that they can actually take whole blood. They can do it much more quickly and within hours they can determine what the pathogen is and therefore target the antibiotic. Wow. So that's just one example, but basically, um, with Sepsis Alliance, which is an organization that I'm involved with, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but sure. I'm on the board of directors and I do a lot of education and I use their information and materials because they're the leading sepsis advocacy group in the country. And um, I just lost my place. So you're going to have okay. to edit No, that's this, okay. Sorry. That's okay. We can edit. <laughs> with um, the Sepsis um, Alliance. Okay. What was I telling you? Can you Sepsi ask the question yes. again? You were, you were um, telling us how the Sepsis Alliance and the T T2 Biosystems is helping innovation. 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 Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so they with Sepsis Alliance, we've started um, a collaborative of people within the industry that can get together all of the great minds that can think and try and problem solve to help increase the diagnostics and increase the treatment as best as we can. And then we're also trying to educate people so that they can identify it more quickly at home and get to sure. the hospital sooner. So okay. all of these things, you know, educating the public, getting them out there, mm -hmm. um, and then improving more rapid diagnostics and improving the care mm -hmm. and the development of antibiotics. These are all things that are going to make a difference. There's a lot involved in the public health about why these are challenges that we won't sure. get into, but right. um, we are really helping bring the right people together. And there are companies on their own that are working on it. And then at the national level, we're even trying to get programs in place that we can make it more um, profitable to develop new antibiotics because right now it's not profitable to develop antibiotics. And okay. we've got to make that change because of antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. We know that some of the ones that used to just be 100% reliable aren't always working anymore. Right. So we've got to get new products onto the market. So all of these types of things are taking place now. Okay, good. That, yeah, that's great. Uh, Katie, what role has mental health care played in your recovery? Yeah, you've been through an awful lot. I mean, like you've been through the mill. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, mental health has been a huge part of my um, experience and my recovery. So um, you can imagine that finding out that you're going to lose your beautiful fingernails and your manicured toes, which by the way, I had like beautiful nail polish on my purple toes. It was <laughs> horrifying when I woke up. Um, and I had, my nails had never looked better. They were like all long and thick on my purple fingertips. It was crazy. But so coming to terms with the fact that I was losing parts of my body mm -hmm. was so incredibly depressing. And it was, I just felt hopeless and I felt depressed and I was scared for my future. It made me anxious. And then um, the hospital experience gave me huge PTSD. And just, you know, even like when I talk about that trauma of waking up, I can visualize that light in my husband and seeing my hands and, mm -hmm. you know, so I've gone to therapy for it. I take antidepressants. Um, I'm fortunate that I don't have so much anxiety that I need treatment. However, I don't sleep well. Mm -hmm. And so I do take something to help me sleep. Even now it's been almost four years, but I'm still kind of sleep, you know, taking something to help me mm -hmm. fall asleep at night because every night when I crawl into bed and when I wake up in the morning, I'm an amputee. I don't even have my legs on during the day sitting here. I can feel my legs underneath me. They're touching the floor. I have my legs on. I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't notice that they're missing mm -hmm. my hands. I've gotten so used to that. I don't even use prosthetics and they function fine. Oh, and I, and I really adapted well over the years, mm -hmm. but when I'm in bed, I take mm -hmm. off my legs and I realize it's 30 seconds. At least I've timed it. I can, I can get them on in 30 seconds if I have to get up and go to the bathroom. But um, I lie there and it just, it, I just feel really um, naked, disabled. You yeah, know, I can't yeah. just get up and walk yeah. away. I need yeah. to take the time to put my legs on. Right. Sure. They're uncomfortable. And so anyways, mental health has been big, just coming to terms with this, but I've had really good treatments. It's been successful. The antidepressants helped me. 
the um, treatments have helped me. I've even had really good treatment for PTSD that's been extremely effective and there are things out there. So I really encourage people going through any medical trauma. Psychiatric care has to be a part of your process for not only you, but your family and friends oh, as well. Sure. Absolutely. It was horrifying Absolutely. for them as well. And oh, for this, sure. And this has impacted their lives. For sure. Yeah. And I will say that your prosthetic um, pedicure is beautiful. Your I think you posted, <laughs> you posted that online. <laughs> And it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I have these cute little plastic feet that look mm -hmm. like my old feet, and mm -hmm. I was able to paint my toenails. It made me feel good. The feet I the feet I wear now are blade style, you oh, know, like okay. the the running blades. Yes, but yeah. instead of looping back behind my leg, they mm -hmm. come straight down so I can wear pants. Okay. But they give a little bounce in my toe, and they're mm -hmm. very lightweight. But the feet are just little black. They look like we're little black slippers, and mm -hmm. it's just a carved piece of foam, so right. I don't get to have those pretty nails. But it's worth the trade off because they're very comfortable. So I can alternate depending on if I want to wear sandals or not, which okay. is nice. Yeah, because yeah, I saw those and I was like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to mention just quickly yes. on mental health too. Yeah. I think the importance of support is really huge. Okay. Um, so either through a support group or even just taking advantage of the doctors and all of the physical therapy and occupational therapy and mm -hmm. things like that, that you sometimes do after an event like this, mm -hmm. just really, um, just benefiting from contact with other people mm -hmm. looking online to realize that you're not alone is huge. Just look up some Paralympians in my mm -hmm. case, or right. look up sepsis survivors or, just kind of search a little bit out. Um, you can find people who've maybe had like a chronic illness or something. And you start realizing there's a community out there of people who've suffered medical trauma that's really strong and vital. And um, I found people online, cancer, cancer survivors and things like that, who I can really relate to. And um, just the support of my family, my friends, my, I go to some support groups. There's um, support groups available for me locally at Harborview Medical Center, mm -hmm. but um, for amputees in particular, but there's also support groups online through Amputee Coalition and through Sepsis Alliance. We've just started a support community. And so we're supporting survivors, their families, their caregivers, including people who've lost loved ones. And so there's things that you can get out there that you're not alone. I mean, it's, I think it's just really important not to completely isolate. Okay. Good yeah. point. Yeah, you have wonderful advice. And I think, um, yeah, anyone who's dealing with, recently dealing with this and um, coming to it, will really um, value your experience and all of your advice as well. Yeah, we can all learn from Right, from and and I know that you were a jet-setting uh, <laughs> go entrepreneur, go-getter before, yeah. but now you're an advocate on top of all that for sepsis awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, was that just like an automatic thing? You just said, I have to do this? Well, it's funny because um, I was a bit of a jet setter because I was a stay at home mom whose kids were now in college and one is now graduated. So I'd been spending the last couple of years since my daughter, my younger daughter had entered college, really trying to brainstorm and figure out what was next for me in life. Because okay. here I am a stay at home mom without kids, mm -hmm. which I would sometimes refer to as being retired. <laughs> but um, but I was really looking for my next step. And I was honestly, I had gotten involved with a fundraiser locally to raise money for a playground in our little town. Mm -hmm. And um, I was starting to figure out what I was passionate about because I really wanted to volunteer some time and possibly get on a board of directors. I was thinking maybe with one of the schools that my kids had gone to or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's funny because this situation bounced me into a position where I was, re I was um, able to meet the head of the Sepsis Alliance. Oh, okay. He came up to Seattle for a sepsis conference and he had seen that I'd done a fundraiser while I was in the hospital and raised quite a bit of money from my friends and family donating to Sepsis Alliance. And this organization had been super helpful for my family. And so I thought I wanna give back to them and this is a great time to do it. While I'm doing this, it could be something I can do positive from the hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, he came, met me, we talked a lot about my story and then he got back to me afterwards and said, we would really love you to join the board of directors of Sepsis Alliance. <laughs> It'll be amazing to have a survivor wow. mm -hmm. and to have an amputee on board. Wow. And um, and we think your story is powerful and we think you mm -hmm. can share it and educate others. And so they gave me this platform and this opportunity to do this. And over the past few years, I've been improving these skills and talking at sepsis conferences and doing different things. And it it just sort of has evolved. But mm -hmm. it's funny because I always joke that you have to be careful what you pray for, because I was literally <laughs> praying to say, oh, you know, yeah. what's next in my life? Right. And this is what happens. So I'm at this point, I'm really extremely grateful because being able to share my experience and to help other people 
and to hopefully keep people from ending up where I did mm -hmm. is just so meaningful to me. So, I mean, I, I am giving, I am giving to others and doing this, but it's mm -hmm. also giving back to me. Oh. It's giving me a purpose that I didn't have before. So it's really been, I mean, it's crazy to think that something like this could be for the better, but I mean, I think at this point, I, I feel like I came out somewhat ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crazy. yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, now, I know that you already explained uh, before how your family and friends assisted you on your journey. Yes. Do you have any advice for family and friends of someone who recently had a limb loss? Yeah, I think um, a few things. So first of all, encourage them to not worry about other things and to focus on their healing process. Because oftentimes with a limb loss, whatever the situation has been, they've been through some type of trauma and oftentimes a, a, a serious illness. So this is a person who needs to get back into shape and who needs to start strengthening their body maybe from a time in the hospital. And so anything that a family can do to help take away some of the burdens or, or maybe to fill some of the position that they had maybe had in their life prior. In my case, I was the main bill payer. I was the I was in charge of the household. Mm -hmm. And so my family, by the time I woke up, they'd had a week to start thinking about things. And they immediately <laughs> kind of explained to me, said, hey, look, we've taught, we've contacted the bank. We're getting the bills paid online. They sort of told me how they were going to take away some of my responsibilities. Mm -hmm. they, they lifted this burden off of my shoulders and made it really clear to me how they were going to manage that without me to give me the confidence that I could just focus on myself. Whenever I started asking questions, they would say, don't worry about that. We've got it covered. You just focus on your healing try and eat a good lunch today, try and get mm -hmm. some sleep. These are all things that are gonna help with your recovery. And those, it seems really basic in the beginning, but that's all so important. I had lost, I lost 25 pounds, I think. I weighed in the high 80s. I started oh. at 112 and I think, Scott remembers I definitely weighed like 88 or 89. Oh my gosh. And I was considered severely malnourished. So I had to get strength and I sure. had to try and keep food yeah. down. Yeah. And I had been on broad spectrum antibiotics the whole time, which had been keeping me sick. And so, um, you know, my job was just to try and sleep as much as I could, take the medications, manage my pain, and um, try and eat. So that's how you start. And then just take it with baby steps. Just know that it's you've got to have tremendous patience. Try and get them comfortable. Um, bring in help if you need it. You know, in our case, we brought in a nurse. It's not cheap to do that. I realize not everyone can do that. Um, use friends in um, really give friends specific ideas about how they can help. In my case, we set up a food train. But we also had it, if the nurse was not going to be available, there were people who could drive me to appointments. There were people who were willing to come and bring me lunch, which they did for several months. I mean, I honestly, I had a food train going for, I think, almost four months. And most of my friends delivered food three, four, five times over that, that period. But they knew that I, it was hard for, you know, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't use right. my hands. And so they just didn't even want to burden my family with having to cook. And that was an absolutely ginormous help but also like being able to get people to drive for me or just come and sit with me. Oh. I had people with me, you know, every couple of days that were coming over and I could talk about what was going on. And right. it was just really empowering for me. For people who don't have a huge network, um, you know, like I say, utilizing the resources, you're going to be going to occupational and physical therapy, mm -hmm. get to know those people, talk to them about your experience, share it with your doctor. Um, I, I made friends, I, I didn't get out a lot. So it's like, I, if I was in a Starbucks and we had to get me into a wheelchair and I would go in, you know, and, but if I could be at a Starbucks or something, I was always chatting up the people behind the counter and just trying to have um, social interactions because that sure. really improved my mood and my spirit. That's okay. right. Okay. Good Great. Advice. Yes, wonderful advice. Thank you. And what has surprised you the most about living with uh, prosthetics? I, um, I think the it, biggest um, thing is just realizing that um, I could almost get back to, it's not the same normal. I mean, it's the, not the same life I had before, but sure. I could, I could do a lot of things with prosthetics. Okay. And, um, and that I think also with my fingers, I not only lost my legs, but I lost my fingers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tried out different prosthetics and I had them available to me through insurance. And I was able to try different things mm -hmm. and come to the conclusion that for me, in my case, where I had more than half of each of my fingers, mm -hmm. I was able to do most of the things without prosthetics. But then to realize that the legs that I had, I was able to walk. I was I, eventually I was able to drive and mm -hmm. I could go on and, you know, I could do small hikes and I can get up and down stairs. And I was able to stand up paddle and do, I was even able to wow. snowboard and I learned to wake surf eventually, 
you know, so I was able to get out once I, I figured out the logistics of like, if my leg falls off, I put a floaty, I put a little, little kid's arm oh, float yeah. around the bottom of my prosthetic and I blew it up. Okay. So it was hanging on the ankle so that if my prosthetic leg fell off while mm -hmm. I was doing something, it wouldn't sink. And so, you know, just trying to figure out creative ways to do things that I'd done before. I was really surprised how much I could actually get back into. All right. Well, very, very yeah. active lifestyle. Also, I, I'm looking. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. No. Um, I also just want to mention that um, one, I, I mentioned this before, but just like going online and realizing I am not alone. There's 2 million right. amputees out in the world. And um, there's Amputee Coalition has an annual event that they do. They had to stop it during COVID and make it go online, but it's a um, it's an amputee coalition conference that they do, and they move it around the country in the summer. And so I was able to go that first year and see other amputees doing things, and that really inspired me. And now I've gone back, and it's it's almost year four, and now I've gone back more as a leader. I got I got certified to be a peer support person, and I didn't mention this earlier, but also when someone is a new amputee, um, get in contact with Amputee Coalition, which you can find online. They're it's amputee-coalition.org, okay. but you can just look up the Amputee Coalition mm -hmm. and um, get their request a certified peer visitor to come and you'll get another amputee to be able to come in and just, just listen to your, um, to your family member who's a patient and mm -hmm. just to be able to empathize with them and kind of encourage them and inspire them to let them see that life can be okay with amputations and that there's a future ahead for that person. That's really inspiring. And I'm now, you know, like I say, I went back the first year and I was just eyes wide open, amazed at like how incredible all the other amputees were and inspired by them. And this time I was able to go back and inspire people and yeah. get certified to be a peer visitor. And then I also do advocacy with Amputee Coalition. It's another place that I volunteer. Oh, that's excellent. So it's really nice to be involved. And even these volunteer activities, mm -hmm. they're healing for me because mm -hmm. they're social interactions. And right, I'm, sure. I'm bonding with other people where we have often other people who've been in the situation that I've been in, and at least where we have a passion about it. Anything like that really can improve the outcome for somebody. Oh yeah, for sure. That's that, we, we gotta advice. We gotta get uh, her to meet Travis Mills. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you may already have met. Did, have you listened to any of our podcasts? You don't have to. I've say listened that. to him a little bit. Yeah, okay. no, we just is we, Travis yeah, we, Mills on there. I'm right. Yeah, he yes, is. He is. Yeah, he's a uh, a quad amputee from Afghanistan. Well, he's not from Afghanistan. No, okay. no, he's uh, he, from the United States, but uh, he was in the army and put his backpack. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he is. Uh, he's also like you. I mean, like just he, gets out there and does motivational speeches. He and, he turned his life from you know what you you could have been a oh woe is me to oh no. Oh, woe is the world because I'm on fire and, and you're going to be my, uh, my Next audience. Next inspiring. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're yeah. taking the world. That's, That's great. great. Uh, do you have any advice, Katie, for somebody who's taking a long flight, let's say from Hawaii to the mainland, uh, something to get comfortable on those long flights? Especially somebody with a chronic illness or right. something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my first tip for anybody is get the wheelchair at the airport. So either you can bring your own, which is great. And, and obviously if you bring your, well, that's not obvious. So you can check your wheelchair, but don't do that. Bring your wheelchair, go in your wheelchair, ask for an escort. It will cut you through all the lines. Certainly if you're traveling international, my husband, and I literally high fived each other when we got through customs coming back from a trip that we just did, because we literally walked through in like four minutes oh. and we sat in first class so that I could have a lie down seat because okay. it, it can be, you know, it can be uncomfortable. Sure. Right. I realized not everyone can do that. It's not always easy to do, especially on a long flight like that. So just getting extra leg room is really huge okay. when you've got amputations or when you have medical needs. It's just right. that little bit of extra space in front of you can make all the difference. But we were on the front of the plane. We were the first ones off in on this trip that we went on, but there was a plane ahead of us. So the entire um, customs area was you know, just wrapped back and forth mm -hmm. with people waiting in right. line. We walked right past that line, walked down to the end. We were the first people. We showed our passports and we were out of there in like a minute. It was wow. the craziest thing. Literally, we looked at each other and high five each other and went, that was crazy. I can't believe how fast <laughs> that was. So one of the perks of being an amputee and being in a wheelchair is you, you do sometimes get to cut lines. And it's not for no reason because I've also stood in lines and it's really painful to stand in lines. Oh, yeah. The hardest thing I do is just to stand. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I also, I have a little bench that I got at like just a backpacking store. That's like a little, it almost looks like a tripod. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but it's a it's a bench and you you it looks like a little tripod it's got a little strap that goes over my shoulder it weighs next to nothing but i can be standing in line at um you know waiting to go through security or whatever and i can just set this little chair down on the ground push it out and, it, and it's got like a little hammock for my butt and i just mm -hmm. sit down on that thing and i can just take the line pressure up yeah and wait yeah and i'm i'm sitting you know up 18 inches off the ground and it's a little bit silly but everyone i always the other thing is i always travel in shorts i always show my prosthetic legs when I'm traveling or if I'm wearing pants, I pull them up so that people can right. understand why, why sometimes yes. I might get on the plane ahead of them or things like that. Right. Right. Um, because otherwise I tend to look a little bit um, just like a normal person if I'm wearing pants, cause I can walk pretty well. Uh -huh. So they don't, uh, they don't realize that although I walk well, it's still difficult for me to have come sure. all the way through the airport. Absolutely. And there. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Um, also, let's see, what are my other tips? And then other tips are things like make sure you load movies onto your phone or your or your your electronic device so you can watch movies because that can help a long flight. Have a good book. I use that time to clean out my email. It's the time that I go through and get rid of all the junk mails or the messages that I just want to delete off my phone. I don't do that real regularly. So I could sit there. I've done it before and sat there for a couple hours clearing off, you know, just cleaning out my inbox. <laughs> so I usually just try and make sure I'm doing something. And then sometimes I try and sleep for a little bit as well. Okay. All right. Good yeah. advice. Yeah. Wonderful advice. Thank you. Oh, I have one more. Yeah. yeah. Get a really good roller bag. The ones that um, someone had, someone carried my bag out for me one time because it was a little bit bigger. And he mm -hmm. said, if you don't mind, just push my bag because just he was behind me and I, and his bag was in front. So I grabbed it and it was one of the stand up bags with four wheels that yes. you can push that way. Yeah. Yes. Whereas mine was the kind that had two wheels where mm -hmm. you lean it back. Mm -hmm. Right. Game changer. I touched his bag. I, I pushed it off the plane and then I went I mean, I got home. And you, you went and buy one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can find them on sale. I mean, they don't, they're not so brand new that they're like all super expensive, but the ones that stand upright there, you don't, you don't carry any weight. You just push the thing. It's amazing. And so I got one of those and I use that for all my travel. And I usually carry my prosthetics on the plane with me so they don't get lost. Oh. And um, so I've got a bag with stuff in. I have two prosthetic legs. So okay. I've got if I, I mean, I have potentially four or six prosthetics that I can bring with me. Right. I mean, I have, I have prosthetic fins that just go over my shins so I could have them with me. And I have feet that I can adjust at the ankle that I got this year because my daughter just got married oh, and oh, I really wanted to have high heels. So I was able to get feet that adjust at the ankle for that. Um, insurance did not cover those. My, the way that my insurance plan worked, they wouldn't okay. cover an ankle that moved. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, um, we ended up taking care of that on our own. But um, I, and then I have the old feet that I got before my athletic one. So anyways, I sometimes will travel with two to six legs with me and I'll, use, I'll put those in my bag and just put them overhead. Okay. And oftentimes people will be kind and help me get stuff overhead too. It yep. helps that I'm also very small, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are a very petite woman. Mm -hmm. And what is, what's, <laughs> what's next for the Sepsis Alliance? Okay, so September is Sepsis Awareness Month. Okay. And um, that's something that Sepsis Alliance started, I think back in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. But it, um, and we've slowly been rolling it out and getting it into more and more states. Mm -hmm. I think over time we've had advocates reach out to the governors in various states and get it get it declared every year. Every year we have to get it redeclared so we can get a certificate from each state. But regardless if it's declared or not, it's always Sepsis Awareness Month nationally. And um, this year we've had, um, we've started a new program where we have an advocacy director and we're trying to get patients and families involved in nationwide advocacy, both at the local and national level. Mm -hmm. And we've always done it nationally and we've, we've done it somewhat at the local level, but it's been a little bit less organized. Now we're really trying to get it in every state and to try and get our survivor community and our, um, and our families and caregivers really active in not only um, learning about what's going on with their patient or with the person who had sepsis, but also to advocate for things that can make a difference. So in that, one of the first things we're having them help us with is getting sepsis declared in each of the states. And we've gotten quite a few this year. And I think we're aiming for 100%, but I don't think that that'll probably happen this first year of doing it with, with okay. our new advocates, but sure. um, we're aiming toward that. And then um, at the end of the month, Sepsis Alliance has um, a sepsis summit. And I think that's, I think it's the 28th and 29th and anybody can sign up online at sepsis.org. It's an online program that'll be going on for two days with a lot of information about sepsis and what's going on in the world of sepsis. And then the other thing that I mentioned earlier is that we have a new program available that's called Sepsis Connect where we're, where we're getting family members, survivors and caregivers together 
we're doing um, support groups online, and I'm hoping to start a specific support group for sepsis amputees this fall. And I'm hoping that that'll be so successful that I, I'm able to kind of groom some of the people in our first support group to then become leaders and we can have multiple for sepsis amputees. Because there are quite a few of us out there. And I think um, we spend a lot of time taking off one hat and putting on the other. Mm -hmm. I know half the time I'm a sepsis advocate, half the time I'm an amputee or disability awareness advocate, or I'm having those difficulties that I want to talk about. But it always seems like I'm in a room where it's either one conversation or the other. And right. I'm really excited to put a room together where we can discuss both at one time because there are a lot of sepsis amputees out there. Sure. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. Um, well, Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm sorry that we made you relive all of that and rehash all of that, but we really <laughs> appreciate it. Um, how can our listeners learn more about you and your advocacy work and get involved? Oh. Thank you so much. So um, first of all, I would point you to just in general where I'm getting a lot of my information mm -hmm. is sepsis.org, which is the Sepsis Alliance website, and also amputee-coalition.org, which is the Amputee Coalition website. So those are my two hats there, the sepsis and the amputee hats. Mm -hmm. um, both of those organizations, they're the, they're the leaders in the United States. They have tremendous services available. I encourage you to get highly involved with both of them. Um, and then you can look up Katie Granger and sepsis, those okay. words together on Google or any um, of your browsers and find a few articles some podcasts, miscellaneous videos that I've done on YouTube and that are sort of out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And then you can find me on social media um, on Facebook and YouTube. I'm just Katie Granger, K-A-T-Y-G-R-A-I-N-G-E-R. And then um, on TikTok and Instagram, I think I'm Katie Sepsis Amputee on both of those, but you can also find them with my name. Okay. okay. And like I say, I've gotten really active on TikTok in the last mm -hmm. few months. I started in January and I have the biggest following. I have 44,000 followers, I think. Okay. And um, so people have really enjoyed and, and been interested in hearing my story and sort of learning about sepsis there. Right. So I encourage you to, you know, come and join my community on any of those websites and um, I'll, I'll keep you in the loop as I'm learning more and more and as I'm sharing more of my story and, Great. and learning about more about sepsis and amputation. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Katie. Thank you. And Thank we, you so much for having me. And oh, we were welcome. going to uh, post this in but we will October, shuffle. We'll but shuffle we're going to shuffle September. it and we're going to be posting this on September 20th. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you. And we'll send you links uh, the weekend before so that you can share it with your tribe. Wonderful. Well, you guys are doing amazing work. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank and you. And it was a pleasure to speak with you and, and great to see you. Um, everything you're doing is just so impressive. Yeah, we're very impressed. Inspiring. Thank <laughs> you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, if our listeners have any questions to, or comments related to today's show, contact somebody else. Um, they can contact <laughs> us at podcastdx.com or podcastdx at yahoo.com our website podcastdx.com on facebook twitter pinterest tiktok or instagram and if you have a moment to spare please give us a review wherever you get your podcast as always please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice diagnosis or treatment and always seek the advice of your physician or the qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because it's something you've heard of this podcast till next week Hello.